I want to thank our moderator, Joe, for his invitation to serve on this panel. I'm very grateful for Dr. Piper, uh, what I took to be an exceptionally clear presentation of the thesis of his book, and to serve next to my colleague, Dr. John Fesco. And I'm very happy, Joe, that our parents did not name us John. There would be much confusion <laughs> on this podium were that the case. My colleague, Dr. Fesco, is going to speak about Dr. Piper's book from the vantage point, particularly, of historical theology. My aim is to address it from the standpoint of the New Testament with side glances into systematic theology. And my thoughts are in three parts. First, I want to express some areas of general appreciation for Dr. Piper's work. Secondly, I want to summarize the book's thesis and the way it's developed. I'll touch on that lightly in view of the work that Dr. Piper has done for us this morning. And then third and finally, raise some areas of concern with the book's thesis and argument. First, some areas of appreciation, three or four. Dr. Piper rightly calls us to think more clearly and biblically about the nature of saving faith. This cannot be taken for granted. At the dawn of the Reformation, the reformers had to define faith in light of the claims of Rome. As Dr. Piper reminds us, in the 18th century, Robert Sandeman argued that faith was simply bare assent to Christ. Some of us remember a generation ago the lordship controversy within evangelicalism. Zane Hodges and others arguably advanced an intellectualistic understanding of saving faith as a sin. More recently, and in a very different direction, Matthew Bates has advanced the definition of faith, pistis, as allegiance or loyalty to King Jesus. And Piper wishes to stand with the reformers and offers thoughtful critiques of both Sandeman and Bates. Relatedly, we're reminded that the reform tradition within which each of us stands, there have been intramural disagreements about the nature of saving faith. Archibald Alexander of Old Princeton, Thomas Chalmers of the Free Church, argued for a highly intellectualistic definition of faith. Faith, as a contemporary described it, simple belief in propositions. In similar fashion, though with less nuance, Gordon Clark advanced a similar definition in the last century. That's not been the mainstream of reformed reflection on faith. And in his work, Dr. Piper rightly calls us away from an intellectualistic understanding of faith without being anti-intellectual. Another area of appreciation is an important pastoral concern. Uh, this was brought home in the middle of the book, about page 139. Dr. Piper reflects autobiographically. He says he's lived in the same inner city neighborhood for 40 years, beset with every kind of breakdown and dysfunction. And he relays how many people have told him over the years they have received Christ, and very few have told him they've rejected him. And yet he observes there's very little in their lives to show that they genuinely believe in Christ. I've lived 20 years in central Mississippi, the buckle of the Bible Belt. My experience has been the same. What Dr. Piper is observing is, to put it in the technical language, the prevalence of historical faith and its confusion for saving faith. And Dr. Piper rightly flags this confusion in the minds of so many. And another area of appreciation. Dr. Piper takes us back to the New Testament. He covers dozens, a couple hundred texts in this book in conversation with some of the best theologians of the church. He is proposing a definition of saving faith and anatomy of faith 
He's asking the question, if Christ is our treasure, which he is, how does that affect the way we think of faith and speak of faith? How does that understanding of faith affect the way we evangelize, make disciples, offer assurance to believers? I wanna move to my second concern or point, and that is to summarize Dr. Piper's thesis. Early in the book, the thesis is put in the form of a question and answer. I summarize it this way. He writes, I want to know if there is in the very nature of saving faith some kind of affectional element. Does saving faith include any element of love for Christ or admiration or adoration or treasuring or cherishing or delighting or satisfaction or thankfulness or revering? I will argue in this book that saving faith does indeed have in its very nature affectional elements, dimensions, or aspects, pages 13 and 14. Now the critical word in that definition is element. The thesis of this book is not that love for Christ, treasuring Christ, is the fruit or evidence of saving faith, nor is the thesis that treasuring Christ is a good work yielded by faith, or that treasuring Christ necessarily accompanies saving faith. Had that been the argument of the book, we wouldn't be here today. But the thesis of the book is that such treasuring, such affections are of the essence of faith. They are integral to faith, page 15, page 16. Dr. Piper affirms, as he did last hour, the classic threefold formulation, notitia, ascensus, fiducia, knowledge, assent, faith. But he argues it's insufficient. These three elements have never been enough, he writes, page 59. We need more. So how does the book argue for affectional saving faith? One of the virtues of the book is that it covers many, many passages. We can only touch on a handful. But I trust a handful that will give us an accurate representation of what Dr. Piper is arguing. He says on page 98, affectional states like confidence and peacefulness are part of what faith is, citing Matthew 6 and other passages. Looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, he says, Saving faith is not receiving plus joy any more than the object of faith is Christ plus treasure. Christ is the treasure we receive, and joy is included in the nature of the receiving. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, which Dr. Piper reviewed with us last hour. He writes, Paul calls attention to the affectional nature of saving faith. It includes a love of the truth, the gospel. Therefore, saving faith is a receiving of Christ not only as true, but also loved. A little later, love for Christ is an essential affectional aspect of saving faith. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The apostle speaks of the love of God, which means that the commandments of God are not burdensome. That is because, Dr. Piper argues, born again people overcome the world. And he says a little later, page 192, this new birth is experienced by us as faith. He concludes, faith and the new birth are the same experience viewed from two sides. Faith dethrones, he says, the enslaving desires for the world and replaces the world with God in our affections, which John calls loving God. Now at this point, Dr. Piper clarifies. He writes, page 193, I'm not saying that faith in Christ and love for God are identical. I am saying that saving faith is a composite of different ways that the born again soul receives Christ. 
One of those ways of receiving him is to receive him as superior to everything that makes God's commandments difficult. John calls this faith, and he calls it loving God. Affectional saving faith. Now at this point, Dr. Piper addresses in the course of his book an objection. If love for Christ is integral to an element of saving faith, how is his position different from that of Rome? Rome, of course, argues that at baptism, by which a person is justified initially, the sinner, according to the Council of Trent, receives together with the remission of sins, all these infused at the same time, namely faith, hope, and love. The sinner is then further justified, and justice or righteousness is increased as faith cooperates with good works. So the form of faith is love, and it will be that faith that justifies. This is fittus formata caritata, faith formed by love, as the Vulgate renders Galatians 5, 6. And Dr. Piper says, I am not arguing for faith formed by love, as Rome argues for faith formed by love. He is quite aware of Rome's position. He is quite aware of Rome's exegesis of Galatians 5, 6. And he rightly argues that that is a mistranslation of Galatians 5, verse 6. Better to take energumen A as a middle participle, not a passive participle, thus faith working through love. He further argues that the faith of Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, faith working through love, gives rise to love for other people. Paul is not there speaking of treasuring Christ, but of loving other people. So saving faith is treasuring, loving, but that is oriented toward God in Christ, not toward neighbor. Neighbor love is, I take it, the fruit of saving faith is not to be identified with saving faith. Well, there's a further objection that Dr. Piper anticipates and addresses. If saving faith is affectional, treasuring in, delighting in Christ, then are we nevertheless justified by love in Christ? And he takes this objection up in an appendix to the book. And Piper argues forthrightly, no. Faith is the sole instrument of the sinner's justification. Christ's blood and righteousness alone ground the sinner's justification. He says, in addition, trusting Christ is not identical with loving Christ one cannot replace faith with love as if they were interchangeable. He says a little further, page 282, saving faith is essentially a receiving of Christ. Christ is valuable, precious, satisfying, a treasure. Saving faith as treasuring is not a giving grace, but a receiving one, page 283. And he concludes, when I use words and phrases like delighting in, being satisfied with, enjoying, and loving, all having Christ as their object, as I use these terms, all of them are receiving graces, not giving graces. So he wants to take care to distinguish treasuring from loving Christ and to insist that treasuring Christ is a receiving and not a giving grace. That's a summary then of Dr. Piper's thesis and the way it's developed through the book. Now, thirdly, I want to raise some areas of concern. By way of preface, let me say that I take Dr. Piper's affirmations that we are justified by faith alone apart from works that faith is purely receptive in justification, 
that we are justified solely on the ground of Christ's imputed righteousness, that not our love to God nor our love to other people is justifying. I take each of these affirmations at face value and I'm grateful for them. The sum of my concern is that the book's formulations and arguments coalescing around the thesis that saving faith is essentially affectional are unable to sustain the weight of those sincerely held convictions. And that's what I want to develop along two lines in the time that remains. I don't believe that the thesis of the book is proven from the text of the New Testament. And I believe the thesis is problematic. Let me take each of those in turn and develop them. The thesis, once again, saving faith is essentially affectional. Let me reiterate, there is no question that faith receives and rests upon Christ as he is offered in the gospel. There is no question that the believer treasures Christ above all. But where the disagreement arises is when the claim enters that faith itself, as an element, treasures, delights in, loves Christ. This claim needs to be proven to the exclusion of other exegetical possibilities. I'm not persuaded that that case has been made. I want to look at four representative passages to show that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. You receive the word in much affliction with joy. Dr. Piper, again, we may infer that saving faith is not receiving plus joy any more than the object of faith is Christ plus treasure. Christ is the treasure we receive and joy is included in the nature of the receiving. But may we not also say, Paul teaches that faith receives Christ as he's offered in the gospel. And the effect or accompaniment of that reception is a joy that is given by the Holy Spirit. That is an entirely good reading of the text. I do not believe that Dr. Piper's reading is necessary or exclusive of others. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses nine through 12, where Paul speaks of those who are perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order to be saved. Verse 12, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Verse 13, God chose you to be saved through belief in the truth. Again, Dr. Piper, Paul does not appear to be making any distinction between failing to love the truth and failing to believe the truth, since both bring judgment. Saving faith includes a love of the truth, the gospel. Or as verse 12 suggests, it includes taking a greater pleasure in the gospel than in unrighteousness. And this reading of the passage compresses love and pleasure and faith into one. But nothing in Paul's statements requires that conclusion. We can simply take Paul to be saying, we believe in the truth, and as those who believe in the truth, we witness as the accompaniment of faith or the fruit of faith, a love and pleasure in the truth. Third passage, Philippians chapter three, verses eight and nine. Dr. Piper writes, the aim or outcome of Paul's embracing Christ as his supreme treasure is threefold. That I may gain Christ, number one. That I may be found in Christ, number two. <laughs> that as a result of being in Christ, I may have a righteousness that is not my own, not from law keeping, but that is from God, number three. So Dr. Piper asks, how does Paul receive union with Christ? 
Answer, Paul gives two answers. The first, verse eight, Jesus became supreme. The second, verse nine, it happened through faith in Christ. And Dr. Piper concludes, these are not different answers. Verse, page 154, faith equals receiving Christ as his treasure. But as we look at the passage, you'll notice in verse nine, both times that Paul mentions faith, he does so in connection with righteousness, the righteousness from God. Faith, in other words, in this passage is the instrument by which justifying righteousness is received, the righteousness that is ours in union with Christ. Paul's point here is not to say that union with Christ is the outcome of faith, true as that is elsewhere. And so we could not conclude here, given the limited way Paul speaks of faith, that faith is the equivalent of receiving Christ as treasure, verse eight. First John chapter five, verses one through five. This is the last passage I wanna survey. Remember, Dr. Piper argues from this passage that faith and the new birth are, he says, the same experience viewed from two sides. And faith dethrones the enslaving desires for the world and replaces the world with God in our affections, which John calls loving God. He says this passage describes one composite way of overcoming the world and removing the burdensome of God's commandments using different language, love for God, faith in Christ. He hastens to add, Faith and love for God are not identical, but a composite of different ways that the born again soul receives Christ. Thus to receive Christ as superior to everything that makes God's commandments difficult, John calls faith and he calls it loving God. Dr. Piper's reading of 1 John 5 verses one through five. And I am grateful that Dr. Piper retreats from arguing an identity between faith and love for God. And I think there is more of a distinction drawn than that reading acknowledges. What is John saying in these verses? Well, he doesn't equate love of God, verse three, and the new birth, verse four. He defines the love of God in terms of keeping God's commandments which John continues are no burden for those who have been born again. Neither does the apostle John equate the new birth, verse four, and faith, verse four. The new birth, John argues, positions us as world overcomers. Faith is the means or instrument by which the newborn believer daily experientially overcomes the world. So how does faith overcome the world? John tells us, faith believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We are sons in the Son of God. And from that vantage point, we reckon and judge the world for what it is. We've only looked at four passages, but I believe these four passages are representative and illuminating of the book's argument as a whole. And I do not believe that the thesis of this book has been established in these passages. It's not a necessary reading. And I believe there are good reasons to read the passages as we've argued. Now, one concern, speaking into the exegesis of the texts, are some problems that arise in my judgment with the thesis itself that speak into these individual readings of the passages. I wanna make a couple of observations. We've argued the thesis is not proven. And now we're reflecting on the problematic dimensions of the thesis. Number one, Dr. Piper consciously distances himself from Rome. 
but his thesis and arguments don't sufficiently distance themselves from Rome. You remember he argues Galatians 5, 6 deals with neighbor love, not love to God. Saving faith treasures Christ. It's not to be identified with loving Christ. Saving faith as treasuring Christ is a receiving grace, not a giving grace. Those are Dr. Piper's claims. But after Dr. Piper says on page 281, nor is trusting Christ identical with loving Christ, one cannot replace faith with love as if they were interchangeable, with which I agree. Two pages later, page 283, love to Christ in this book is another name for treasuring Christ. Therefore, like treasuring, it is not an addition to, nor the result of trusting Christ. It is an aspect of trusting Christ. It is another name for treasuring and therefore has the same role as treasuring. It seems difficult to escape the conclusion that faith, trust, and love are in these respects equivalents. And we need more distance from Rome's formulation, faith formed by love, to sustain Dr. Piper's reformational convictions that he articulates in this book. What are the problems with such an identification of faith, trust, and love? I think it's worth articulating them. For one thing, there's a definitional problem. Paul takes care throughout his correspondence to distinguish faith from love. Certainly at Galatians 5, 6, though I'd argue one could not exclude love to God from the love of which Paul speaks in that verse. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, where faith and love are distinguished and their love must encompass love to God. So definitionally, Paul keeps faith and love distinct. Conceptually, there are concerns. How are we to think of trust or love as a receiving grace? The passages that Dr. Piper cites with respect to faith as trust involve sacrifice on our part. Philippians 3, verse 8, everything is lost, the loss of all things. Hebrews 11, which we heard last hour, Moses gave up the treasures of Egypt. Hebrews 10, verse 32 and following, Christians experience reproach and affliction, the plundering of our property. It's hard for me to understand these actions as receiving they strike me more aptly characterized as giving. That is relinquishing or giving something up. So let me articulate the concerns in the form of questions. How can, in light of this thesis, Paul meaningfully and analytically distinguish faith and love? How can we speak of faith as strictly receptive in justification? How do we ensure that justification is by faith alone, apart from any works done, whether in the flesh or in the spirit? Let me suggest a resolution. Think we can achieve everything Dr. Piper wants to achieve if we affirm that faith is inseparable from love, while necessarily distinct from love. And the same could be said of treasure. So we neither separate the two, Dr. Piper's concern and mine, we do not conflate the two, which I believe the formulations in this book risk doing, but we distinguish the two. 
Not separated, not conflated, but distinguished. And that, I believe, addresses the concerns and brings resolution and allows us to affirm our common convictions. There's another area of concern, and it has to do with assurance of salvation. Again, Dr. Piper recognizes the problem. He addresses it preemptively in the book. He asks the question on page 263, if affections always have differing degrees of intensity or earnestness or sincerity, how is assurance possible? Dr. Piper replies in a number of ways. He says, well, scripture teaches that faith is variable and subject to change. He speaks against, and rightly, the cavalier confidence of once saved, always saved, free from the damning effects of sin, but not its dominion and power. And he concludes with a helpful exposition of Romans 8, verses 13 to 16, Paul's path to assurance. But I'm not sure that that discussion gets at the nub of the problem. To be sure, good works are necessary to a believer's ascertaining assurance. Westminster Confession of Faith, 18.2, they are the inward evidences of those graces under which the promises of life are made. But the deepest and primary ground of assurance is faith resting upon Jesus Christ, receiving Jesus Christ as he is offered in the gospel the direct act of receiving Christ for salvation. That's the way Paul reasons at the end of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. The deepest roots of assurance are not in our love for God, but God's love for us in Christ, sending his son to die on the cross and rise from the dead. And we can ask an experiential question. If faith involves treasuring Christ along the lines of the thesis of this book, how would one know if we have loved or treasured or delighted in God sufficiently? Not to answer the question, I am looking for evidences of saving faith but addressing the very nature of faith, laying hold of Christ himself in the gospel. Becomes very difficult to see how a firm and established assurance would arise. So as I conclude, I wanna end where I begin, with appreciation for Dr. Piper's desire to be faithful to scripture and in conversation with the Reformed tradition. As always, he gets our noses in the Bible and the best of Christian theology. And grateful as I am for his noble aims and convictions with respect to the Reformation's teaching about justification. My concern is that this book does not rise to meet those convictions and aims. My concern is the argument of the book and the thesis embracing that argument strikes at those convictions, undermines them. And so my prayer as we continue to reflect together is that this time will help us to sharpen one another. The better to understand, the better to explain to others what it is to walk by faith and not by sight. Thank you.